if you ever go somewhere, make sure you're running towards something. As a martial artist, you have to have ownership of your journey. Welcome. You are listening to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 616, with today's guest, Mr. Francis Cordon. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show, founder of Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. What does that mean? Well, go to whistlekick.com. You can see what it means with all the stuff that we do. One of the things that we do is we sell some stuff that's part of how we pay for all of this. And if you use the code PODCAST15, it lets us know that you listen to the show and that leads to buying some stuff and you save 15% in the process. If you want to go deeper on this or any episode of the show, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You're going to find every single episode we've ever done. We give you two each week. And it's all under the goal of connecting, educating, and entertaining you, the traditional martial artist of the world. And if you want to help us, well, you got a lot of ways you can do that. You could buy something, like I said, but you could also share an episode, maybe follow us on social media. You could tell a friend about us, maybe pick up one of our books on Amazon. We're adding more all the time. You could leave a review somewhere, Google, Apple Podcasts, you know, whatever makes sense. Or you could support our Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Whistlecake. It's the place you're going to go for that. And you can support us with as little as $2 a month and $5 and up. You get access to exclusive content. Like earlier today, I recorded the exclusive podcast episode. With the $5 tier, you get a bonus episode. You go up, we go up, we give you more. Check it out. Patreon.com slash Whistlecake. You know, over the years of this show and of Whistlecake in general, we've connected with a lot of people, a lot of martial artists. But I have to say, the way that today's guest connected with us was a first, different than anything I'd ever seen. And it led to us talking, and now we're here. It was a while ago, a few months ago, that I saw an email from someone saying, hey, I liked your show, and I did kind of a follow-up on my YouTube channel. I hope that's okay. And if you have feedback, let me know. So I checked it out, and it was... Mr. Cordon, building on an episode that Andrew and I had done. And not only did he do so in a very kind way, but he added to it in a really awesome way. And I really dug it. And that kicked off a conversation that has led to me appearing on his podcast or his his channel, I guess is a better way to say it. And now here he is. And it's a great conversation. He's a great guy. And I've got a feeling that this won't be the last time you hear from him on something to do with whistle kick. So here's my conversation with Mr. Francis Cordon. Francis, welcome to Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio. Jeremy, thank you so much for having me. I am a big fan of your work and I couldn't be happier to be here. Well I'm I'm honored. I'm honored that you're a fan. And you know, this is our second time getting to talk and, and we we're doing the opposite of what we did last time. Last time our, our first time really talking, I was on your show. And you were. And now you're on you're on our yeah. show. Thank you so much. Yeah. I, I love when we get to do that. I love I love when we get to, you know, flip the table, so to speak. And, and you know, you got to learn about me. And today we're going to learn about you. Yes. And when and you I'm, were in I'm my psyched. show, it was tremendous for me. It helped me a lot. I got a lot of feedback on that. I still can't okay. believe it. Like I'm, I'm <laughs> really one of the days I'm going to wake up and say, wait a minute. I have to contact Jeremy and ask him because that never happened. It's too good to be true. And so I, you know, I it, thank you. I'll say this, and then we're gonna we're gonna turn this back. We're gonna make this more about you. We've been doing this for years, and so because we've been doing it for years, people look to us and they're like, "Oh, you know, you've got this big show," or 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 they compliment us, or they 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 say really nice things. And I'm just a guy who started doing this and did not stop. And I think there's something very synergistic there with martial arts. You don't have to show up with a lot of talent or any skill, or even, you know, the ability to use your body, you just keep showing up and eventually things happen. And that's, this podcast is a perfect testament to that philosophy. That's wonderful. In fact, I hope later in our conversation, in with regards to the practice, this topic comes up because it's one of those that I really, I'm trying to really spread that message. You know, people go through moments of hardship and, and doubts and stuff. And the only thing you need to do is keep going. There's no mm. magical skill. There's no, all you have to do is not give up and keep going. And so in the practice, uh, this is a reality and you can see it at work. So that's what you've done. 
with your practice, but also with your podcast. And it shows there you are, you know, more than 600 <laughs> episodes inspiring people. Thank you. Thank you. Now, it's, it's, of course, easy to look at things in that way in hindsight and feel good about it and trust it. Oh, yeah, I just kept going. But being on the other side or being in the middle of it and saying, you know, do I keep going? Am I on the right path? You know, that, that's, a, that's a, uh, a frustrating, a scary part. You've been training long enough that I'm sure you've felt that at certain times. Say, you know, am I, am I on the right path? How do you reconcile that? How do you, in the middle of something that is a struggle, say to yourself or motivate yourself or whatever you do, how do you keep going? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. And, and I do have uh, sort of a methodology that I have, I guess, devised um, that works for me. And I'm not sure that it will become a technique for everyone to use, but I can share certainly what I do. And this is applicable, obviously, for, for the martial arts and the journey. But also, to be honest, it happens every day. People are thinking, I'm having a hard time at work. Do I look for another job or keep going, right? This, this happens in relationships. This yeah, happens all over the place, right? My take on this is don't run away from anywhere. If you ever go somewhere, make sure you're running towards something. As a martial artist, you have to have ownership of your journey. It's not your sensei. It's not your sifu. It's not your school. You have to own it. You are working on yourself. The subject of what you're doing in martial arts is you, is that development and growth. And so occasionally, or sometimes, we go through hard times, right? Now, if you are just in the void of that darkness, so to speak, that the, the days in which you feel you haven't made any progress or anything like that, that's not a good time to make an emotional decision and quit and start looking for something else. That is a good indicator. That is, it's, you have to stick through it. I remember being in previous jobs in which, you know, when we had the hard times in the company is when I know for a fact I'm not going anywhere because those will be the times that I remember as the highest growth. But there is a time in which that has passed. You're feeling pretty good. And maybe the awareness comes that uh, as an individual, as a martial artist, you need something else from a growth standpoint. And that can happen in many, many ways. There may be time to find another angle, another style of teaching, or maybe just a compliment. We can talk about that later. But that feeling of running towards something that through practice develops in your heart, the desire to complement yourself is more reliable than, gosh, this is hard. I'm going to run away from it, right? Because it eventually it's going to happen again. There's no growth without that feeling of hardness, right? It's, it's necessary to go through that hardship. Yeah. There's something really poignant in the simplicity of that running to versus running away from. And there may be some people listening and, and they're saying, well, you know, you could easily run to the wrong thing. But I, I would guess if you in that situation, let's say, you know, there's there's some temporary problem or, you know, you're just you're not willing to grind it out, you know, something that would obviously be temporary. I bet if you were to really unpack the reasons that someone may run to something else, it's not that they are running to something else. They're running from something and trying to justify it mm, yeah. with the running to. Yeah, absolutely. What is the true motivation in the action? I think that's the critical point to evaluate. Yeah, and it, exactly. One, one way to, to, I guess, the trick is, you know, if you're going through one of those really, really dark and difficult times, it, then it's better to not even consider it. because. Uh, it's hard that you will have the clarity, the emotional clarity to, to, to know that you're not running away from, but toward, towards, right? But not because it's good or bad. The other thing I want to do here, Jeremy, is I don't, nobody should feel guilty. This is not about making people feel bad. This is about the highest levels of growth. So the other thing I like to say when, you know, when friends that know my passion for the art and ask me questions, you know, what is right? What's, what's right in my journey? Don't imagine that there is some sort of cosmic baseline and our job is to determine what is right and there's every other possibility is wrong. The truth is all paths are right as long as we keep going and to take them as lessons because we'll keep making adjustments. So I think it's very liberating to think as a, as a journey of growth because we don't have to worry whether we have found that one true path. It's not about that. I think whether you go right or left, you keep learning. And you'll keep going. And the only secret, as we said at the beginning of this, is 
continue mm -hmm. and you keep go growing. One of the most common philosophies I've heard among, you know, we can call it, you know, new age metaphysical sorts is you are where you are supposed to be, you know, and, and, and derivatives of that sentiment, this idea that what you're experiencing, what you're going through is what you need. It's you've made these choices. They've led you to this place and you've got to work through the thing in front of you. And sometimes that is remaining in it. Sometimes it's determining that you've got to get out of it. You know, that that is the best choice to run to something else that is more appropriate once you've determined that. And I think that that's really a, a fascinating aspect within the martial arts that so many people bypass because of what you just said about trying to determine what's right. You know, they're trying to find this correct or best. I'm, I'm, you're, you're not even here looking at me. I, we're not doing this in video, but I'm still using air quotes. Mm. Yeah. This idea that there is a, a best a universal best that can be applied. Yes. And, and how does that incorporate in the conversation? Yeah, it's absolutely what happens all the time. And, and we're talking about journey decisions. So the, the topic of best is very clear, but think about the internet today, how many thousands of times per day, maybe millions, people are asking, what is the best martial art? What is the best for this, for that? There we have in life this mentality of what is best. And the truth is, look, the journey is something you need to own. It's also sometimes a little lonely. Nobody's gonna tell you, you know, nobody's gonna tell you micromanage your journey. You have to own it and, and show your desire to grow and keep growing. And and some people are made to learn from one or two sources and they enjoy this aspect of going deeper and deeper. Other people are really good at having many sources and incorporating them into a system that makes sense, but we're not trying to be eclectic. We're not trying to build the machine from parts that don't match. Uh, it has to be something that applies to yourself and applies to something that you you can use and you can uh, and uh, aligns with your goals, right? So, whether you're considering what's your best martial art or if you're doing something, what's the best decision you can make now? Uh, I think it's liberating to think that you know, as long as you keep showing up. You know, I'll give you an example so the listeners hopefully can understand. You know, in, in I have a day job in the IT industry and I present to customers, I do presentations, right? And honestly, sometimes they're horrible. You show up and you have a bad day, right? <laughs> and two years later, someone who was on that call with you calls you for a new job because he has great memories of you. And you're like, but wait a minute, man, that was a horrible call. I did horrible. So yeah, I'm not calling you because you had a bad day. I'm calling you because you were there. You kept showing up to the day. I could count on you. We all go through ups and downs. We're not looking for perfection. We're looking for reliability. We're looking for, will you be there? Will you keep showing up for the day and try your best? And don't let it bother you that sometimes it's good or bad. The other thing, Jeremy, you know, you're, you're, when you have students and they think they, that day they didn't make progress and they didn't learn, how do you know enough to know that that day wasn't as productive of others. It's just the feeling you have of, oh, today I didn't, I didn't do well in class. May not be that reliable. It may be that that day was one of the best for your martial arts learning because learning martial arts isn't easy. So that's the message in a nutshell. As you were talking, I'm thinking about schools that I've been part of, the school that I had. And when I think about the students who ultimately have, let's say, succeeded, you know, what, however you want to define succeeded, they earned a certain rank or they were there for length of time, developed a certain amount of skill, whatever it is. I can't think of a single one that in their early days, I looked at them and said, that person is the person who's going to be the best in this, you know, current crop of students who's come in. It's always someone kind of just there, right? They show up. They're not the best. They're not the worst. And they just plug along. And I'm using the word just in, in a way that implies that it's simple. You know, showing up to class time and time and time again is, is it's simple, but it's not easy. You know, there are plenty of things that can distract us. Exactly. But it, it's, it's almost like we have this secret recipe for success in anything. And people just 
don't want to acknowledge it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes it gets tough and sometimes people go through hard times. And you know what? It's, it's, it's okay to take a break. Like the other thing we're not saying here is that people have to be superheroes. If you feel very tempted to make a dramatic decision, it's better to maybe just take a break. Sometimes, you know, have you noticed the way humans, the way people are way harsher to themselves than they would be to a friend that comes for them to, for advice? If someone comes to you for advice, you'll be very gentle and you try to take a step back and help them see the balance of things and prevent, maybe help them not make a, a dramatic decision that they'll regret. But when we talk to ourselves in that inner dialogue, we can be brutal. We can be very harsh. And so, look, if it's hard, if it's time to make a decision, why not take a break? Because we put so much on our shoulders. So an average martial artist has a full-time job, family, and then they deal with the martial arts and the fact that maybe progress doesn't happen as quick as they thought when they saw the movie, The Big Boss. And so, you know what I mean? It's, part of it is adapting to the difference between what it is to progress at an art uh, versus what you imagined and finding the joy in the daily of that. And, and life has a lot. And we have people these days work more than ever. And with the working from home with the pandemic, people have no... There's no time to work. It's 24 hours a day, right? You can be online all the time. So be easy on yourself. I think people have to learn to treat themselves like you would treat a friend in need. I agree. And then to extend that analogy, we're even more kind to strangers, generally. If a stranger asks you for advice, you're going to give really good advice or, or be very kind and sensitive. If a family member or friend comes to you, you may be a little rough on them. Yes. And then, of course, as you said yourself, you, we, we, are, we are the most cruel to ourselves, which is, is so strange that familiarity breeds contempt or resentment. Exactly. And, and that's a very good point. Sometimes we're the most impatient to the people we love and and it, you know it's it's a shame because the meaning of those relationships is is being partners all along through life and going through ups and downs right but even this aspect you just mentioned think about training i can think of hundreds if not thousands of instances of trying to do something my my teacher in martial arts is showing me right and i can't quite do it and i do it and i do it i get frustrated so i can't do it why can't i do it and his words are very simple Look, instead of analyzing and all that, just keep doing it. It takes time. You thought it was going to take a week and maybe it'll take three years. You know, the, don't worry. It takes time. It takes time. One day you look back and it turns out that thing you consider so difficult. It's not only something you do easily. It's become a strength. Mm -hmm. That's another beautiful thing that the martial arts journey had for me that I didn't even, I didn't even dream of that the weaknesses become strengths, but it's not through analyzing them. It's just through doing them and being patient and letting them be, let the universe work its magic to just practice. And one day you look back and say, wow, this is, I didn't even realize when this happened. I can't even point the finger when this happened, you know, and, and that makes everything worth it. It's beautiful. Absolutely. How'd you get started? Oh, Jeremy. Oh, many years ago. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, well, okay. So there's a, there's a couple of situations in my life that um, I guess uh, happened not at the same time, but roughly through the same stage. I was very young. I, I was born in, uh, in Spain, even though uh, I live in the States now, but I grew up in Madrid. And my father was a very traditional man and he loved martial arts. We lived in a time in, in uh, we didn't have a lot of media. We didn't have a lot of... Um, globalization because Spain was closed to external influence because of a dictatorship we had back then. Mm -hmm. And we didn't really have a lot of influences. But one thing my father knew about was Bruce Lee. That's the one thing we had that had come from the outside. It's an incredible uh, thing that if you think about how many barriers that has eliminated that other, other external, you know, I guess social phenomena did not. So my father planted that seed of 
love of the martial arts. And for a while, I was just reading about it and fascinated with it, but not really training. And then the time came that I was uh, a little older, not quite a teenager, but almost there. And um, neighborhood started getting a little rougher because the, the dictatorship had ended. And, you know, countries go through a transformation period. Um, yeah. And it's it's rough. Spain is a pretty safe place now, but I went through a very difficult time in which the country was trying to adapt to democracy. We didn't know what that was. And so there was, you know, drugs on the street and crime for the first time in many years. And so it was hard. And I started, honestly, having, you know, rough times when I was walking down the street a little later than normal. I would find groups of kids with knives or sometimes, uh, I kid you not, syringes with HIV. They would, that was the latest thing and it became fairly normal. And, you know, they came for my money because they wanted it for drugs. So this was not bullying in the school with all due respect for people who got started that way. That's okay. But that was not my story. My story was, was very scary. And you know, I got, I remember one day being punched in the stomach, left on the street after they took the money. It was very rough, Jeremy. Hmm. And for me, it was fear also that started uh, changing my life. Like, am I going to stop going out with a friend? Because now I fear this guy coming from the corner to ask me money. So I started martial arts in my desire to gain confidence and um, went to, to a school Um and started training a system that I loved. And you know, one funny thing that happened is, as I've been training my current system more and more and more, I am thinking more and more of my original system and lessons I learned that were almost like they're dormant. You know, it's almost like I appreciate it more now that I can look back. When I was doing it, it was very much a little bit frantically and for survival, and I was very young. Um, but looking back on it now, I can see so many lessons. And back then, it, there wasn't a lot of like, we were a little crazy in those years in Spain. So like everything was very full contact and things like that. And to be honest, I learned a lot of lessons, but what it did mostly is give me confidence. Now, I don't want any listeners here. Imagine that now when I went to the street and these people came, I was like, I can't, f I can fight 27 ninjas. No problem. It, it was nothing like that. All it was is that I didn't panic. And then I, I put my foot down. And then they left. Because those guys don't want to fight you. They want your money. If you're not an easy target, why would they come for you? They're not fighters. <laughs> They're drug addicts. So it was never about fighting them. Why would a fight have to do anything with that? That's more self-defense, right? It's a social phenomenon. Gave me the confidence. And that issue went away, Jeremy. So I'm one of those people that can say martial arts saves my life. And it's not because I, I kicked someone's butt, but because I put my foot down and it was incredible. It changed my life. Wow. That's, it sounds like that's pretty fortunate. You know, I, I have, um, now you're, you're when, when you're talking about the dictator, you're talking about um, Carlos, right? Carlos the first. And now, uh, so Carlos was a king. And right. he actually was exiled because of Franco. Franco was a dictator. Franco. Okay, that was the name I was looking for. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I, I have um, I have an uncle from from Valencia. Oh my God! Yeah. I so spent yeah. Many, I, I spent a lot of time in Valencia. I have aunts in Valencia. Or, if I want to pronounce it properly, properly, Valencia. Valencia. Exactly. Very good. Very good. <laughs> I've, I've got I've got a, a little little bit of Spanish. A little bit of Spanish. I've I've only been there once, but it was a long time That's ago. Wonderful. Uh, and and you know this this era you're talking about, I I heard bits and pieces of this. You know, didn't didn't get to experience it, but it, it's interesting because what you're describing is something that I don't think very many people because you're you're talking about the '80s. Yes, that wasn't that long ago. That wasn't that long ago. Yeah. And and you know, Spain is a country now that is known as you know Europe's vacation destination. Yeah. <laughs> people come from all over the place in in Europe to go vacation in spain on, on on the ocean on the beaches yeah. and it's relatively inexpensive and it's you know it's just it's a it's a spot people go but it wasn't that long ago nobody was going to spain yeah and i'm guessing that the timing of this it was because of what was going on that you're 
not there now. Did, did you, you and your family leave as a result of all this? No, um, we last, my family never left. Eventually, oh, okay. eventually I, I traveled about 15, 16 years ago, I settled in New York, but, but yeah, it was rough times that we got to, to see a turnaround too. We got to see when, but you know, later in the late eighties, beginning of nineties, it got better through the mid nineties. It was actually a pretty nice place to be. I was born in the seventies. But yeah, those say that age would have coincided with the early eighties or mid eighties when it was the worst because it was going through that transformation. Mm. All right. And what's funny and, it's a, it's yeah, a concept go. here that I, I haven't heard often in podcasts or, or blogs, and I think it's an opportunity to talk about it. My particular experience, you know, back then in school, it was also like we fought a lot. Friends, we just fought. I don't know how to say it. It sounds barbaric, but but in those years it was normal. And we fought pretty crazy. And you would come home with seven bruises, and your dad or mom wouldn't even look. It was like, oh yeah, as long as you have all your teeth. Which one day I lost one, by the way. But we we did fight a lot. And what's funny, if you look at today, the the concept of self defense and fighting, they are pretty much uh, in many times in the narrative. It goes together. But for me growing up, these two things had nothing to do. You know, fighting was just a, a familiarity with your body that we had, we fought, and that's how we bonded. And my best friends were the ones I, I fought with the most. It was pretty brutal, by the way, but it's what we did. And we were very familiar with, with that men. Whereas my experience on the street and the real reason why I did martial arts had nothing to do with that. I didn't even expect it to become a fight in the street. It's a funny thing that for me, those two things are very decoupled. Uh, mm. Whereas I'm thankful that I had the experience of both because even though they were hard, or one of them was hard, the other one was fun. But it gave me familiarity, right, with, with what we're talking about. I think it was a very important foundation for my art, but I did not connect those two, you know? Mm. There are people who say that we have a, a tendency toward violence, that it's part of how we create social structure, as human beings and that we're working to counter that instinct as, you know, mature society. We're trying to suppress that instinct. Is that what you're talking about? You know, what some, I mean, when I was a kid, it, it wasn't quite to that extent, but you know, there would be scuffles and, and, you know, people would push each other around and a lot of the adults would say things like, Oh, kids will be kids. Boys will be boys. You know, roughhousing, wrestling, you know, somebody accidentally catches an elbow. There isn't an intent to harm. There's an intent to yes. dominate, to, to show superiority. Is that what you're talking about? What maybe at a more... Um... Yeah. Okay. I think it expresses itself that way. It must be, right? I don't know, but I suspect is just a natural thing we see it in animals too right i think it's a natural it's how they play they play that yeah. they play and they learn to hunt it that way right so for us it was a natural thing nobody had to teach us and yes it came out and i suppose there's a natural uh need to develop that in people uh somehow and if you channel that the right way and you start making it into a science that connects with your own body mechanics, then you have martial arts. But sometimes I ask myself, think about martial arts. And some people could say, even though we don't say it often, right? A study on, on violence or, or at least with certain undeniable relationship to violence. And yet it becomes a beautiful dialogue between you and the person you're practicing with. I mean, extremely beautiful and enjoyable. A, a, a way of communicating with someone that you couldn't put into words. And yet it's in the guise of violence, even though that violence has its swim lanes, so to speak, right? So yeah, I think it's at the root of being human. And, and, and again, some of the best martial artists that have done this, they're the most peaceful people. It's not like they want to harm anyone. It has nothing to do with that. I think it's more of an expression of something internal that becomes a way of communicating with people. And when two people agree on that, it's consensual. And, and they can do it's like, equivalent to being a drill with someone or, 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 you know, some sort of sparring or it becomes very good. It becomes a form of communication. Do you think that fact that I think most of us would, would agree that the majority of martial artists are, 
not quite as violent. If we, if we were to do, have some way of measuring this, that most martial artists are fairly peaceful or, or at least avoid violence. Is it that that is who is attracted to the martial arts or does the martial arts have an influence on people's perceptions of violence? Yeah. The, you know, that's so interesting you ask me that because I have asked myself that question, right? And not being an expert, I, I suspect there's a combination of both. But if you think about it, on one hand, there is the very common sense possible conclusion that what we were saying earlier, something is innate to the nature of, of people. Therefore, by being in a discipline that allows you to express it, you're more balanced because you can let it out in a controlled way. You know, when I was a teenager, I, I had a temper. And I remember my parents saying, man, you got to go to your dojo because my first system was Japanese. Uh, so we called the dojo and we said, we got our dojo and hit the heavy bag, man. Let it out, man. And they saw it as a healthy thing that I had a way to let that out, you know? So on one hand, it's that. But on the other hand, if you have had a background like I did, very serious, related to violence, um, you despise it and you really don't want it. And that's the cliche is true that many people do martial arts because they don't want true violence. And that's because they have experienced it. I don't know anyone. I mean, at least I personally don't uh, know anyone balanced psychologically who has experienced true violence, not what they think is in the movies and all that, and actually want it. It's, a, it's, a, it's terrifying, you know? And people who experience that and go through martial arts, they do it because they don't want it. They do it because they want to have the power to avoid it or prevent it, or in the very worst cases, protect others because they know it's so horrible and so scary. Now, you mentioned that you started in a Japanese style, but I know you train in a Chinese style now. I would imagine being in New York, you would have had plenty of opportunity to choose from Gosh, I just population wise, everything has to be available to you fairly close. Yeah. So it was probably a choice rather than feeling forced. What what made you step into a Chinese? Yeah, thing? yeah, good good question. Yeah, to be honest, the, the and remember I mentioned that my dad had planted the seed of yeah. investigating Bruce Lee, and and I I went pretty deep in that even very young. I knew things back then about Bruce's life and teacher and system just through magazines that we had, not really TV. There was not much TV. Uh, I knew a lot of things back then. I remember. Uh, and so I think in my heart, I was looking to exper experiment with Chinese systems because of that influence. I just simply could not find uh, what I was looking for. And, you know, the school uh, that I went to was promoting this system and I ended up being really happy to do it. But when I came to the States, eventually, I guess I was continuing my search for, for this, knowing that coming to New York would increase the chances that I would find that here. And that's kind of what happened. Uh, but, I, but to be honest, even in that system, Chinese martial arts, I went through a few iterations, uh, which lasted years. It's not like I did three months and gave up or anything like that. Years, I'm talking about six or seven years of trying one, one way and I was still looking for something in my heart, a little more free, a little more random in terms of expression, not because it's better, but because I'm basically, I'm looking for myself in this search of, of what's, what's the, what's what my heart is asking for. It looking for oneself doesn't mean looking for what's right, but I needed that. And so I eventually found my current teacher uh, who uh, took me already years ago and something clicked. I felt very much at home with my own expression, very free, a little bit, we're a little bit like uh, Kung Fu, Kung Fu Mavericks. That's kind of a nice title. We were very good in terms of just training the parks and we don't have a uniform, we don't have a system, but I don't advocate that. It just happens to click with me right now. And I ended up settling in the very same system that I kind of dreamed of when I was six years old and my dad started planting those seeds, but it was a tremendous, uh, you know, I don't know how the universe did this. It's very interesting. And I certainly wouldn't say that Chinese martial arts versus Japanese, none of that. It was just a personal search of what clicks with what's inside me. Okay, I get it. 
Now you talked about that, let's call it a, a, a longer transition, training in a variety of Chinese arts as you found this one. And I know a little bit about what you do and, and you just told us a little bit, you know, it, it doesn't sound like a large commercial enterprise. And mm -hmm. I think I've heard you say at some point that your instructor is really choosy mm -hmm. as to the, who he will, who he will take on his students. What was that process like? How did you find him? And how did you decide you wanted to to go through all that? And why did he accept you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God, Jeremy. I asked myself that. <laughs> how on earth did this happen? This is amazing. <laughs> yeah, very true, very true. Um, as I said, um, the Mavericks of Kung Fu, my, my teacher chose in his life at one point to make a living with a day job and therefore be able to be very, very picky with teaching. So he'd rather have a very small handful of students that he feels good with instead of a commercial enterprise. But please, I repeat this. It has nothing to do with whether commercial is good or not. He doesn't have it in him. He doesn't want to run commercial, even though at one point he did it for a few years. And so... I think it's very smart in his case, to be honest with himself, that he has a job and he doesn't have that financial dependency on, on students. And he is very, very picky. So how uh, I found him or he found me? So something in my practice after a few, uh, not a few, uh, quite a few years uh, in this other system I was doing right before, um, something was there, right? Eventually I would sit at my computer and look for something else. But I wasn't attracted to anything else that sounded just the same because, again, I was relatively happy. Um, but I knew that something was missing. It had to do more with an alignment, my desire to practice a little more randomly, train in a more chaotic way. I, I wanted to be ready for something I associate with success in martial arts for me was dealing with randomness, right? D dealing with chaos. And I, I didn't really have it, but Again, it's something very personal. So I landed on a, on a website. No disrespect. If my teacher listens to this, he'll chuckle. But it looked like a website from the 80s. We didn't really have internet in the 80s. So that gives you an right. idea. Uh, he does that on purpose, right? Nothing that looks good commercial, but there was a presence. There was a website. And I don't know, something authentic attracted me. Maybe it's that aspect that it wasn't a nice, appealing website. The fact that this was clearly someone who didn't care about keeping that updated and to put 17,000, you know, uh, pictures of how good he is. And I was attracted to that. Someone that wasn't promoting himself, you know, as, as, a, as a Superman or something like that. I don't know why, Jeremy, I landed on that website and I sent an email. And, and this man responded very carefully. He was like, hmm. Tell me about yourself and why you want to do this. You know what I mean? It wasn't even like, okay, you found me, come train. It wasn't even that. And so I ended up sitting down and saying, all right, but well, let's just put it here. And I, I opened myself and, and wrote quite a few things in that email. And, and even after that, he was like, okay, let's meet one day, get to know each other, and we'll see after that. You know? Um, and then we met, and the rest is history, as they say. Uh, I think there was a, a great click. I was fascinated. His openness, he's very informal person, not caught in the current trend that everyone is a grandmaster. And again, I say this with respect, but again, looking for something that clicked with me, very humble person, um, clearly knew a lot. I knew enough, Jeremy, to be able to read someone by touching hands. And the martial artists that are listening to this will know exactly what I mean, right? That's another great joy that the martial arts will give us if you stick through enough. You touch hands with someone and you can feel it. You can determine things, you know. And I was really impressed. But yeah, at the same time, his demeanor was so humble, clearly not eager to sign up, clearly not eager to enroll me. And that attracted me even more. And that day, ooh, just uh, clearly he and I connected. And um, it's been a roller coaster of discovery and. And, uh, you know, an amazing journey. And 
someone who encourages me to continue exploring and on my own journey, not, not by any means to be dependent on him. It's, I'm very thankful to him. Nice. Now, we, we heard a bit about what you were looking for, and I, I think most of us could empathize with what it's like seeking out a new school. You know, even if you haven't been through that process, the idea of looking for something new, most of us have looked for a new romantic relationship or a new place to live or a new job or a new house. We, we understand what that process is. It's about understanding what your needs are, what your wants are, and logistics and, and a bunch of that. So I, I think even if people haven't been through it, they can they can understand it. What is your sense about the other direction? What was he looking for in you? If he was this choosy, yeah. if he was almost having you audition in a sense, do you have a sense as to what his parameters were for taking you on? Yeah, I, I do. I not perfect and probably not accurate, but you know, through the years of training with him and having had. Uh, some conversations, because most of our dialogue, uh, Jeremy, is through training. Uh, and this is very much a practical person, not someone you really you sit and talk and talk. Um, but eventually, you know, after years and years, you get to know the person fairly well. And I think he his parameters had to do with someone who, number one, someone who would question things. So he's told me, occasionally, and this is something that, I, I don't know, I just was educated this way growing up. You just question things. So how else are you going to really learn something? Don't be a parrot. You know, you have to question. And question just doesn't mean ask a question out loud. It doesn't mean just that. It, it means a mental attitude. Whether something is true or not, the truth isn't in acceptance, it's in making it yours. And if you don't question things and try them and experiment, and it, how are you going to learn, right? It, almost think about this way. The way we see the role of the teacher is to give you a blueprint. But the real learning happens when you play with that blueprint, with a friend, with a Kung Fu brother or sister, with, you know, your forms at home. Play with that blueprint. Ask yourself, wait a minute, why is he telling me to put the elbow here? What happens if I do that? And that attitude is what he likes. He despises, and that's a word we, we were laughing about because we don't really use that word, but it was a little bit of a joke, right? If someone just wants to consider it like a belief system, right? The martial arts have this beautiful thing that they're rooted in the body and they should promote honesty. And it doesn't mean one thing is true or the other. It means... You have to make it work for yourself. And the attitude of questioning things is something he's absolutely, positively, actively uh, looking for. And the other one is thinking about things, which may be related, right? If I teach you something today and you see me in a week, the fact that these seven days in between this session, you've been thinking about it, you've been making it part of your life. You're saying, wait a minute, you know? I understand. With the, you know, there is a saying that when Bruce Lee, and I'm sorry for injecting Bruce, I, I love. Uh, no, quite, quite all right. I, <laughs> yeah, I said a lot. He, he's been referenced a lot <laughs> on the show. I don't expect that to change anytime right. soon. So one of the things about Bruce, a lot of people imagine Bruce had a lot of talent. And maybe so, maybe some talent. He also overcame tremendous difficulty. But what he had was tremendous passion. So his teacher would give him something. And by the time he saw him next week, he had done it 10,000 times. I mean, 10,000 times. As much as someone would have taken years to do if you just do martial arts once a week, right? And so it's that passion that made him repeat it and experiment with it. And by the time he sees Bruce a week later, he's advanced months because of what he's done with that. And his teacher was in love with that attitude, to be honest. He said, yeah, Bruce may or may not be talented, but man, he works hard. How do you work hard? Because you have a passion for it, right? And, and he's, he, I guess you're asking the parameters. My teacher, I guess, is looking for someone who stays with that. If he teaches you something to, look, I'm going to say a secret here. We have forms in my, in, my, in my training, just like many other martial arts have forms. One thing I've learned through I myself giving this to someone else. There is no way to fake whether you're training at home or not. If I give you a form today, 
and I see you in seven days and you've been doing it every day, your teacher will notice. It's something shows. It shows, you know? And so in the training, that work you do with the blueprint is really the learning and it cannot be faked. And you do it not because it's in the book of good behavior for martial arts students. You do it because you love it, because you have passion for it. I get it. Totally get it. Now, you mentioned IT. You have a career in IT. We've had a lot of martial artists on here who have careers in technology. And I've got a working theory, and and you may have heard it before, but I'll ask you, why do you think there's so much overlap between people involved in tech, in IT, computers, and those who train martial arts? Yes, absolutely. So a lot of my martial arts friends are in IT. And a decent number are in music. And these look like very different endeavors, but in reality, there's a connection, right? And I don't know if this is the only explanation, but when I started in IT, it was about expressing my creativity. I started very young with home computers. These are computers today would be in a museum of (laughs) museums. Like it would be old stuff even for a museum. And... And I was one with that machine. I could make that machine do whatever I wanted. I could create graphics and movement and I could create sounds. And I was just a a geeky, you know, kid. And for me, it was very much art in the sense of what is art? Uh, Expressing yourself honestly, right? And later on, IT became too big. You have IT administration, you have, but there's always this ability to experience creativity, to, to play with the machine. Maybe programmers, which was my background, even though I haven't done it in a while. But that's really what I did for many years. Uh, by the way, it's the same thing my teacher does, interestingly enough. To your point of how common it is, it, it's creativity, it's expressing yourself, which is really why we do martial arts, expressing ourselves, and really why musicians are musicians, to express themselves. There may be other reasons, maybe the practical reason that there is more work and one has to feed the family. And it's not a bad career to have in terms of opportunity. Maybe that influences too, but I do believe there's an aspect of creativity and artistic endeavor or or expression too. I'm with you. Get it. All right. Now, where's your training headed? You know, we've talked about a lot of the philosophy and, and, you know, barely scratched the surface on what you do. You talked about chaos and and the desire to get better in chaotic situations and, and, I would imagine that would extend to dynamic and varied and probably part of why your school trains in different locations. And when you talk about not having a uniform, to me, that means street clothes and you're probably training with shoes on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is this the plan for the indefinite future? Are there aspects of your training that you're looking at and saying, you know, I I want to spend more time on this than I have been? You know, how does how does that on unpack for you. Yeah, that's, that's a question. And it's, it's a very interesting one because only when you see enough, you can see what you do don't see, right? So it's one of those questions that it's a little tempting to answer too early. Uh, but yes, I've become, so to begin with, there is the feeling that I have when I train with my teacher that I'm a beginner and I enjoy it. So to be honest, it could continue like this for many years because I have this feeling, you know, one of the titles I gave myself earlier was Kung Fu Maverick, that perhaps a little bit ambitious. Mm-hmm. You can also call me the eternal beginner because that's how I feel many times when I train with my teacher. And not only with my teacher, we train with Kung Fu Brothers and between us and, and all that. But I enjoy being a beginner because it's that sense of endless opportunity ahead of me the field ahead of me that I can explore that is appealing. So to begin with, even in the material that we're familiar with, I have the feeling that when you really become aware, you realize you're barely scratching the surface. But that said, the more you train, the more you realize that there's certain gaps in the, in, in what you've uh, accomplished because we need to be honest, we don't get good at what we say the system has. We get good at what we train again and again and again and again, and we have trained more things, uh, some things more than others. Now, 
I am not one of those martial artists that looks at the gaps and feel the need to train them all. Some of the gaps I've become aware I have, I don't have an attraction to do them. And Jeremy, this is important for me because as a, as a, I'm already, you know, almost, I'm 47, Jeremy. There it is. The secret is out. <laughs> and so, it, honestly, my life choices are not about overcoming zombie apocalypse. So I don't feel the need to become good at everything that martial arts can give you. But a few of these gaps I do uh, feel some attraction towards. And my teacher and I, have talked about it occasionally. He's encouraged me to always ask him. He will address those. Or I will look for a way to learn those. And it doesn't mean any betrayal to the system or anything like that, because he sees himself very much, he's very practical. He sees himself very much as a guide and a coach. Um, and he wants people to, he wants people to go ahead. You know, he told me something that, it's made me think a lot the other day only, just a few weeks ago, he told me this. He said, if you are a student of a teacher in any discipline on earth, what teacher wants you to be with him forever? What teacher wouldn't want you to go ahead to the next level with another teacher in physics, in mathematics? What teacher would say, no, the right path for you is to be with me forever? That, that's his personality. I'm not saying that's what's right or wrong. I'm saying that's who he is, right? And he, again, he can do that too because to be practical, he doesn't have a financial because we got to be practical in this world too, right? It, it's a very sobering perspective. I don't know what's going to happen. I feel I'm still a beginner in his material, even though I've been doing it for years. And um, I could continue like that. But there are some things I'm going to explore and uh, mentioning to him, we're starting to explore things that all of a sudden we're starting to practice that we didn't do before. And he's enjoying that exploration too. And we'll see where it goes. But the awareness of gaps in the training does occur. And it doesn't mean you need to train them all. You need to train the ones that you feel a pull towards. Because at the end of the day, Jeremy, we do this to be happy. That's the real, most practical reason why we do martial arts today. I love it. I get it. I'm right there with you. <laughs> awesome. A few more things as we start to come into the, the final chapter of our conversation for today. And, and you mentioned somewhere towards the top of the episode. Yeah, I, I have no doubts that you will be back on the show at some point talking about something. Yeah. You talked about gaps in your training that, that don't interest you. Tell us a little bit about what really does interest you that you're exploring now and what doesn't. Yes, that's very interesting. So um, I think it can be helpful in the conversation um, to contextualize the art. And so far we've been vague because I worry about mentioning names that create division in the audience, but perhaps Jeremy would it be okay to mention the name of the system. Of course. Okay. So you know, uh, what it is really is uh, Wing Chun in the style or in the system of Wang Chun Leong, which I'm sure has been mentioned many times or it, your listeners are familiar with. But what's interesting is by the time I came to my teacher, I was so done with labels. I would have studied with him if he told me his style was George Lee one and I say that because his name is George Lee. So I like to say, Francis, what do you teach? What do you train? I train George Lee Chuan. Because when I put the label of what I do and I compare it to what I see in YouTube and stuff, it's like, mm, it doesn't feel like the same thing. So I'm not sure the label helps anyone. But in, in the greater principles of the system, people identify us as uh, more uh, striking, right? Uh, we are known for being good at striking and close combat, uh, cl close range, and things like that. What attracts me is the ability to use those foundational skills to, ex to, to exercise control and dominance without hurting someone, which is not common because the system has built in a pretty aggressive uh, attitude. Right? Part of it is the aggressive attitude, which gives you a psychological uh, edge. But I'm very attracted to 
which is harder, Jeremy. How do you take that those same principles and use them to exert control without actually having to get someone a bloody nose or something like that? And the reason I say that is because the life we live will have many more chances of social violence in which the law isn't on your side to really hurt someone. And to be honest, you shouldn't even desire to hurt someone. You should be repulsed by the idea. And so the ability to put someone in their place with no harm can be done with this art is a recent discovery. When I say recent, I mean a couple of years ago, I realized that just with a little bit of an adaptation of the art, it can be done without actually hurting someone, maybe by controlling the balance, maybe by controlling the uh, space and pushing and things like that. In many social situations could be enough to put someone in their place or end an encounter without actually getting into a situation which now you have to be worried about being sued and the, and always living with your with yourself too because you could have hurt someone severely, right? And that attracts me tremendously, but not just philosophically, even from the body mechanics standpoint, Jeremy. It's just, if you think of your art, you know how, Jeremy, everyone is looking for the deadliest art and I'm thinking like, man, mm. What happened with society? We need the absolute opposite. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I mean, this is not the zombie apocalypse. This is not like your question, which is really good. It's like, you know, would we do well in, in the zombie apocalypse? <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, it's really not where we live today, right? And so I'm very attracted to that concept. Can we take our art and can we adapt the body mechanics to control someone without them really being permanently hurt? And that attracts me. What doesn't attract me to the rest of the question is more and more brutal techniques, more and more deadly techniques. How do you, how do you hit this particular pressure point and they will die in five seconds? And I'm not saying that's even true, but, but there is a certain art of really causing injury that maybe the SWAT team or the Navy SEALs need to know. I don't need to know that. I have no interest in knowing that. And that's part of the art that doesn't attract me. Got it. Makes a lot of sense. If people, if people want to get a hold of you, email, social media, anything you're willing to share publicly? Yes, absolutely. Um, there are several ways. I have been working uh, hard also because another, another... Oh, and, and your YouTube channel. Exactly. We got to make sure we mention your YouTube yes, channel. I mean, that's, how, that's ultimately how we got connected. Can't believe I, I, I dropped the ball on that. Yeah, My bad. Yeah. <laughs> well, what happened is here I was training maybe five days a week, six days a week. And it wasn't enough, Jeremy. I needed to speak about martial arts. I needed to let it out. I'm burning here with passion. And so I started a YouTube channel, <laughs> you know? Uh, and the YouTube channel is not about me doing any martial arts demonstration. It's really the philosophy of martial arts. And recently, in great part, thanks to your help, I've taken it to the next level. And I've uh, I started a series of interviews with my friends and network and other people that I am connecting with. And so that's, um, my name is Francis Cordon, and it's just really the name of the channel. It, it will put the link, but if you look for a channel called Francis Cordon, so instead of giving it a, fan, a, a fancy name, I just call it Francis Cordon, right? Because I started just ranting, and now it's become a series of interviews that I, that I talk about. The other thing, Jeremy, uh, a friend of mine, uh, a student of my same teacher, so my Kung Fu brother, his name is Dan Mankas. He's a sound engineer. And he has a podcast that I co-host with him. But we don't do a lot of content because we're very busy. And he's very busy. And he's the engineer. Mm. Uh, so uh, a thousand exits.com is another way to get a hold of me. A thousand exits.com or my YouTube channel, uh, Francis Cordon or francis.cordon at gmail.com. That's my email. Easy. Easy. But, but plenty of things. Man, you've got two podcasts. Yeah. Sounds like somebody else I know. <laughs> yeah, it rings a bell. <laughs> it does. I, I feel seen right now. Awesome. This is fun. Glad we got to have you on. And so you you know this next part. You know, what are your final words to the audience? Yes. Yes. Um, look, if, if there is one thing to remember, other than the fact that just listen to someone with a funny Spanish accent and we don't know what he said, <laughs> remember the following. If you're practicing martial arts, don't let anyone tell you 
what should your goals be? What is the success criteria? The fact that a martial art should be self-defense or sports combat or traditional. Don't accept the baseline from anyone because the internet and the current world is just noise, even though when you use it wisely, it can also inspire you. Make your choice based on what you feel like in your heart, because for you to have the passion to do this for the rest of your life, you're going to have to enjoy it. And once you've agreed on your own success criteria, what is it that you want? Pursue it and be truthful to it. Look for a system and a teacher that agree with that. Don't, don't try to contradict yourself. Grow with it and do not take anyone else telling you what it should be or shouldn't be. It should be what makes you happy and have fun with it for the rest of your life. I hope you enjoyed that. I had a good time. I've had the chance to chat with Francis on a few occasions, email and social media, and just really enjoying getting to know him. And I think it's a perfect example of how there's enough room for all of us. You know, one of the things that we don't talk about too often is the fact that anybody out there with a podcast or, or doing something in the martial arts space, I'm more than happy to give them a platform because I wanted somebody to give me a platform when we started and nobody was willing to. I refuse to do business that way. So Francis, thanks for coming on. Thanks for your friendship, your support. And I know we'll talk again soon. Listeners, I hope you enjoyed that. And if you did, go to whistlecakemartialartsradio.com. Check out the show notes for episode 616, photos, links, all that good stuff. And if you're up for supporting us in the work that we do, remember, you've got lots of options. You could share an episode, leave a review, tell a friend, or contribute to our Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. And, you know, don't forget, we've got training programs at whistlekickprograms.com. And we've got new ones coming out all the time. In fact, if you're listening to this even a few months into the future, there's a good chance there's something new that wasn't even in existence when we recorded this episode. So check it out, whistlekickprograms.com. I think you would be surprised at the quality that we're turning out versus what we charge. Actually, maybe you wouldn't. We're all about value over here at Whistlekick. Don't forget the code PODCAST15. Saves you 15% off anything at whistlekick.com. And if you've got feedback or guest suggestions, anything like that, email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>